I'm a product designer, um, which for hardware is a little bit different than for software. Um, I used to run a design consultancy. You guys have heard of like IDEO? People know IDEO? Yes, IDEO. Um, so I used to run a company just like IDEO, a little smaller, but we help big companies think through sort of product design and strategy and, and sort of first production runs. Uh, Ferrari, you guys may know Ferrari. We, there was one of our big clients. Um, this was this crazy product that we built, um, which is a $20,000 stereo speaker for Ferrari. And this is for, you know, you buy a Ferrari, you spend all this money, but you only drive the car like, you know, five days a year or something. And so literally at the bottom of the order form for Ferrari is a checkbox where you can hit, yes, I would like one of these speakers to show up with my car when it shows up. It's painted at the exact same paint uh, as your car when you buy it. Um, sort of a silly product, but really fun uh, from a design perspective. Um, Snowshoeing, I think snowshoeing is pretty big up here. Um, so this is um, a, a pretty um, awesome snowshoe company that we did a lot of work for. And this was the first um, uh, I iPhone Bluetooth accessory, which now there are many, many, many of them. This was the first one to ever hit the market, which is a universal remote control for your phone. Uh, and so you walk into a room with your, your, your iPhone turned on. This thing connects over Bluetooth, and you can control your DVD player, VCR, CD, all that stuff. Um, I now run a company called Bolt, um, which is actually fairly similar, but instead of working with big companies, we prefer to work with little tiny companies that are all building physical products, so all hardware companies. Only these hardware companies are all a little different, but I'll get to that more in a minute. Um, so we're structured like a venture fund. So we invest in companies um, at the seed stage, so pretty early companies. And then we have a big engineering staff and a shop, actually two shops now, one in San Francisco, one in Boston. And we help with the product development process as part of the investment that we make, which is sort of a unique thing for a venture firm to have a shop, but I think it's pretty awesome. Um, so here, here are uh, sort of some example companies that we've invested in. This is a company called PetNet, um, which builds a pet feeding device. Um, but the real business model here is they actually sell pet food. So you f when you buy this device for the first time, you put your own pet food in there. And then when the food runs out, it, your little app says, hey, you know, you've run out of food. We, we noticed that your dog eats you know, at this frequency and this kind of food. Why don't you try this other food? And hey, click now, and it'll show up at your door for free. Um, and so this sort of changes the way uh, pet food is sold and delivered. Um, this is a company called Clique, which is making digital content physical, uh, which sounds uh, backwards, but it's actually a really interesting way to re-engage with sort of the experience of playing albums or videos or mixtapes, uh, which we're really big fans of. Uh, and this is a company called Dipjar, uh, which uh, builds this really cool device where you, when you go to a you know, a Starbucks or whatever, and you want to tip your barista, but you don't have any cash on you, which I don't carry cash anymore. Uh, and this is just a little jar, and you dip your credit card in there, and it charges you a buck and gives that dollar to the barista all, all electronically, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, but let's talk more about, about hardware. Um, I'm not a big fan of talking about uh, what I do. I think it's more interesting for you guys to see some interesting stuff. Um, so uh, we've been using hardware for a really long time. And this is sort of like the center of the universe is built around hardware. Americans spend far more money on physical things than they do on digital things, despite the fact that most sort of technology folks are really focused on software. Um, and hardware is really still everywhere. It is sort of the main ecosystem that we exist in. Most of the things around us are still physical. Um, and uh, you may know of this place, Silicon Valley. A lot of people have talked about it. Um, you, you might forget that it's silicon, which is a hardware thing. And, and Silicon Valley was really started from a bunch of really hardcore technical companies. These are all venture-backed companies that have uh, been worth billions of dollars at various points in time, some of them still so. Um, but when the internet came along, uh, we sort of stopped paying attention to hardware, at least in the startup scene. And, and hardware was sort of this weird thing that no one really wanted to talk about. Um, instead, we had this explosion of software companies. And they're really amazing companies for, for, for most part. Um, but to me, a hardware guy, it's kind of boring. Um, when you want to build a hardware company, most VCs will tell you, go away. Um, we don't do that. Uh, that's expensive and costly and slow and really hard. Um, and, and there's some weird things about that. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, the first thing is nine out of the 10 largest companies in the world that build technology are hardware companies. The exception to this rule is Google. Um, but many of these companies you'll, you'll, you'll recognize, many of these companies have hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue, huge, gigantic companies, all through selling hardware. You also, this is something that people are very surprised by, five out of the 10 largest venture capital exits in 2014, so companies that were invested in by VCs and then were sold, acquired, or IPO'd were hardware companies. And many of these companies you may know, GoPro, uh, which is a really awesome camera company, Nest, which we'll talk about in a minute, Oculus, the really cool VR system. Um, these are some of the largest exits of the last 12 months, and they're hardware companies. Hmm, kind of weird, right? 
And the reason for that is that hardware really isn't hardware anymore. A, a traditional idea of the way hardware works has changed. Um, and so I'm going to give you a little example. This is um, a thing you probably all know and hate, or at least I hate. Um, you know, the old sort of crappy thermostat that you have that your landlord left in your building, you know, years and years and years ago. And the typical model for businesses that sell crappy old thermostats like Honeywell is you buy a thing and it gets less valuable over time. Right? So usually you're really excited, you like, <coughs> excuse me, you take it out of the box, you play with it, it's this really cool experience, and then it kind of sits there on the wall and it's kind of like not very interesting to you. Um, but when you connect hardware to software, something really cool happens. Um, and a really good example of that in the thermostat world is Nest, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, this is, in many ways, a pretty simple product. It just controls the temperature in your room. It's not rocket science. Um, but it does so in a really different way than a normal, typical, like Honeywell crappy thermostat does. Uh, and so the value of this product changes uh, over time in a good way. And oftentimes, this comes from firmware updates or a new feature that they might add or the ability to control your phone from different places in the world or whatever. Um, and that's really powerful. And so many investors uh, that are starting to think about hardware now think about it as a Trojan horse. Um, there's this phrase that I love, which is hardware is really software wrapped in plastic, um, which I think is a pretty neat way to think about it. And, um, and so it's a really good way to put software into places that it can't currently go. Uh, like, I'm really frustrated by the fact that I see everything on a screen. And like, screens get kind of boring and flat to me. There are so many other parts of life that don't have software involved that could. Um, but hardware has um, some really interesting things that have changed in. There's sort of like three fundamental parts of what makes sort of new hardware different from old hardware. Um, the first thing is commoditization. Now, many of you, you may recognize this company, Jawbone, really interesting company. It's actually been around for a while. Um, they invented Bluetooth ear sets, which are uh, now a really big category. Um, and this, this category, which is pretty cool, these, these wireless Bluetooth speakers. I'm sure many of you guys own these. Um, this was a really good idea that they came up with. And now this is a multi-billion dollar market. It's huge, and it's come out of nowhere. It was like three years ago or four years ago. But now everybody builds these things. You know, you can find 20 companies, maybe more, 50 companies that build Bluetooth speakers. And it's because there's no software that makes this work. You use your standard iTunes library or your Spotify playlist or whatever thing you're used to playing music with, it's not a sticky experience. Whereas, whereas you take a company like Pebble, which is a, you know, the, sort of the first like, smart watch company that you all may know, and the software experience as part of building hardware makes this thing sticky. And so people com keep coming back and using this product. This is really different than buying a normal watch that you just put on your wrist and don't really think too much about. The second thing is it makes it really easy to gauge how people use a product. In the traditional sort of like old school hardware world, you would judge the success or failure of your business by how well you can sell a product, right? So if the product sells well, you're doing a good job and the product must be wonderful. And if the product doesn't sell so well, something's probably wrong. But in the beginning stages of a hardware company, it's actually really hard to tell how things are going. You might only make 5,000 units and determining if those 5,000 units are making people happy is hard unless they're software. Because now you can keep a really keen eye on what's going on in the background with how people are interacting with your product. And so investors love to look at hardware companies where they can show there's growth in the way people use that product. Uh, and so if you're Nest, for example, when you're starting out, people would say, man, people play with their thermostat much more often than they used to. And that's a really good sign that people are engaging with the product. And the third thing is recurring revenue. This is probably the most important thing. And this is what makes most hardware companies that we've just sort of talked about with the big exits of the last couple of years and many of the new ones that are getting started really interesting, um, is the fact that they're monetized more like software than like hardware. And again, with a typical hardware business, you would sell a piece of hardware, typically 30% gross margin. You have all these people taking little, little tolls along the way, especially those pesky retailers. Um, and you would wind up with you know, maybe 10 or $20 for a product that might cost 100 And that's kind of a bummer, right? You did all this hard work, but someone else is making all this money. Um, and so recurring revenue allows you to still make that 30% or 40% profit margin on the product that you're making when you sell it at Best Buy or Home Depot or whatever. But it also allows you to keep selling something in software that's really high margin. And that really changes the structure of the, finance, of the finances of the company. So this is a really good example of a company called Dropcam, um, which Google slash Nest um, bought uh, not too long ago for about $500 million. 
And the reason for that is people would buy this camera, uh, and it's a pretty cool uh, but standard uh, sort of well-designed camera. But it had this really interesting feature where you could pay money per month to keep the storage of that camera online in the cloud for, forever. And that really changes the way you, you use the product. This, this sort of connected hardware, people use this term Internet of Things, which I can't stand. I don't know what that is. Um, I, I, I really prefer sort of connected hardware or, or, or device to device. Um, this is going to change everything. Uh, and this is not a little thing about, man, your, your, your blender talks to your TV, talks to your, you know, your, your phone or whatever. Those things are not very interesting. A, a lot of these applications are things that you don't typically think about. Uh, industrial gas and energy, um, optimizing the way car batteries are charged, um, deciding how you know, manufacturing and prototyping is going to work. Um, software is crawling into all these places that current, currently can't exist. Um, and so I, I think the, the purpose of, the t of this talk is to talk about what are some of those ways that people are thinking about building these new kinds of hardware companies. Um, and so I have about 10 of these business models, and these are things that we funded or have looked at before. Um, all of these companies, to me, are sort of represent the next wave of interesting hardware companies. And hardware will, will continue to become more and more interesting over time as it becomes sort of more and more similar to hardware in certain ways, in the ways it's monetized. Um, so this is sort of the most standard way, and this is sort of, sort of accessorizing a product that already exists. Um, so one of my favorite companies um, that, that's really keen on accessories is this company called Rest Devices. They build a product called Mimo, which is doing really well in stores right now. Um, and this is if you have a little baby and you want to keep track of that baby, not with like an audio. Um, I don't, I don't have kids, so I don't, I can't remember what they're called, but the little like walkie-talkie things to like listen to the baby monitor stuff. Um, you guys aren't very helpful here, huh? Um, and so this, in, in, instead of just listening to when your baby's crying, it actually predicts how the baby is sleeping, if the baby's rolled over in a funny way, when the baby's going to wake up, et cetera. Um, so it's this pretty interesting technology that's really not very invasive. There's a little turtle that you can sort of see on the onesie. The business model, even though they sell a product at a 30 or 40% gross margin in the beginning, their main business model is selling these onesies, right? And so there's all different designs and cute little things that, that you can get for your baby. Um, and they all work with this sort of rest devices system. And so that really changes the way you think about the business because they're going to continue selling these onesies over the life of that product, or at least while the baby is pretty small. I, I don't think you want to wear onesies for too long, um, but maybe a, a year? Is that a year and a half? I don't know. Uh, yeah? OK, cool. Thanks for the help. Um, OK, the next is content. This is a really common one, right? So you have some digital asset that people want to pay for. Um, I think a really good example is, is one of our portfolio companies called Mural. And they build this really beautiful art frame. But instead of a standard sort of like piece of paper in there for, for a print from a museum or whatever, it's this really beautiful display that you actually really can't tell is digital um, by the way they've done the finish and the, the, the backlight control. And so their business model is not to sell big devices, um, they, do, they do that, of course. But what they really care about is selling artwork. And so they take a typical uh, art print that might cost $100, $1,000, $500,000, depending on how nice it is, and digitize it in this really high quality way that no one else can do, and display it on their screen. Uh, and it creates this really cool experience that sounds silly until you see it, and then it's really interesting. Um, and so their, their, their business model is all structured around content. They're optimizing to sell as much art as possible. OK, this is a, a little bit unsexy, but these are my favorite businesses. This is closing the loop. So you have um, a, a current system that's open loop or requires a human to make it work. There are many, many, many fields and many, many, many jobs that are sort of old, unsexy things that people have to do every day to keep the world working. Um, one is, uh, is, is one of my favorite companies called Loci Controls. And they, they um, uh, have this really interesting model where they're helping people generate electricity from trash. Uh, and so this is a big thing in the US. I think it's fairly common in Canada as well. Uh, huge in China. We're, I think we're enter, wherever there's a lot of uh, population density, this is sort of a regulated thing. Um, and so the EPA in the US requires that landfills drill these wells to capture methane that comes out of the trash as it's decomposing. And the way this works now is sort of amazing. At most landfills, there are, these, there are hundreds of these little t tubes that, that, that you can sort of see coming out of the earth. And if you guys like drive around landfills, which I don't know why you would do, but you can see them all sticking out, and they look kind of goofy. And the EPA requires if you have uh, uh, trash over a certain tonnage, you actually collect the gas, and you either burn it, uh, flare it off, and you see like fire coming out of the landfill, or you put it into a generator, and you, and you turn it into electricity. 
And so the way this works now is there's a guy, this kind of old crotchety guy that walks around. He's got a little meter every two weeks, and he puts the meter into a little hole. He says, oh, there's a bunch of gas coming out of this one. Let's turn the valve on. And then he kind of walks over to the next one, you know, 50 feet away, and he sticks the thing in again. And they, this is his job, right? He's paid to do this all day. What these guys do is they unscrew a valve, and they drop a computer-controlled valve in, in between where the gas is coming out and where the gas is going to the generator that monitors the gas every 15 seconds. And so it says uh, very precisely when uh, the exact sort of chemistry is right, they'll open the valve a little bit more and monitor it, and then open it a little bit more and monitor it. And they control the feedback loop of how electricity is generated. And it turns out you can generate about 50% more electricity by doing it this way. You didn't, you didn't do much. You just installed this system with some software. Pretty cool. These guys don't charge anything for the product. They pay for that themselves, and then they charge a service fee every month for maintaining the software. Um, and this is something that landfills are happy to pay for because their revenue goes up, because this is how they make money. Uh, OK, data. This is a, a very common one. The best example of this is probably like your phone, um, but that's kind of boring. So um, this is a startup that's based in New York. Uh, and they build this, um, I think, really interesting product that allows you to share data with other people for Wi-Fi on your computer or your phone. Um, and so it's this little tiny device that's connected over, over the cell network, the 3G or 4G cell network. And you have this really cool sort of social system where you can share data with people that need it when you're, when you're out in a coffee shop or whatever. Um, and they monetize, again, the the, the device they do charge for, but they're not looking to make money on the device. They're looking to make money on the data. And that's how their business model is set up. Advertising. Uh, this is a tricky one in hardware. There's actually very few companies that do this. Anyone have a, have a guess of one that does? No? Big company? Amazon. Yes, good call. Nice. Um, so Amazon. So you can buy this Kindle, um, which some people have, uh, which is, I think, $20 or $30 cheaper than the sort of standard Kindle, which when you turn the display off, it actually shows an ad. Uh, and so Amazon says, if you want to look at ads, we'll actually you know, reduce the price of the product to pay for you. Now, this is not Amazon's primary business model. It's actually really hard to find advertising companies that, or hardware companies that primary business model is advertising. Uh, that will happen more in the future. But this is sort of a pretty good example of a company that, that does do that currently. All right, we're about halfway done. You guys awake? Yeah. Any questions? You guys have any questions, or interruptions, jokes? No? All right, cool. All right, baked in. We're, gonna, we're talking about baked in. Uh, this, is, uh, this is sort of like components, which is a big part of the world. Um, a lot of people make a lot of money selling components. Um, but th these are different components. Uh, this is a company called Electric Amp, and there are many of these companies. Um, but they sell a little piece of hardware that allows you to put Wi-Fi into a device really easily. Like, I can do it, and I don't know shit about this stuff. Um, and so this is a, a component that you buy. It's actually pretty cheap. Um, but the real magic here is that they have this really cool software system on the back end um, that this Wi-Fi device connects to to make managing and deploying Wi-Fi in devices really, really easy. And so you pay per month per device to actually maintain the connection of these products. And so these guys don't really make any money on the hardware. They kind of sell it at cost. But they're looking to have people, more and more people use the service that they offer with the hardware to keep it running. Um, and this is something that has one really awesome side effect, which is that it's very hard to take these out um, because these are embedded into products that you use. And the customer doesn't deal with this at all. It just makes the experience better for them. It's the company that makes the device that has to focus on it. And we always like business models like that. OK, transactions. Um, these happen all the time as well. This is a big part of the way money is moved around the world. There's a little tiny transaction fees. And so uh, a pretty good example of a transactions company is Dipjar, which I talked briefly about before. And so um, these really focus on, on two main types of businesses. One are quick service restaurants. Um, and the other are charities. And so these are people like the Ronald McDonald Foundation or March of Dimes and other folks that are really dependent on cash donations or gratuities. And so I don't know, I don't go to McDonald's very often, but I hear that if you go to McDonald's, there's this box uh, next to every register where you're supposed to put a buck in um, if you have some extra money to give to the Ronald McDonald Foundation. And those boxes are empty now because people don't use cash as much as they used to to pay for things. And so this company is really aimed at disrupting the way people give tips to people to make it much easier to be generous. Uh, and so they have all kinds of strategies for dealing with that. But the primary mechanism is this machine where you just dip a credit card into it really easily, and it gives you this really good feedback um, that you tipped. And it's really fascinating. One, one of the reasons uh, that people tip is, did the person in front of you tip? And you might notice this happen. Like when someone tips in front of you, you're like, oh, fuck, I really got to tip this guy now. Um, and it's, I think it's a really good thing, but its social behavior is really important to the way people think about generosity. And so this thing has this really 
funny little like lights and sounds that kind of spin. So it's very obvious that someone just gave a tip. Uh, and the, 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 the retailer can put custom messages on there. There's a little display that will scroll across. Uh, Thanks, John, or whatever. Um, and so, so you, you really incentivize people having this positive experience to, to be generous to their, to their barista or their service person. Um, one of the other really interesting elements here is this serves as an HR company as well. Uh, and so when you uh, do work at a coffee shop and you check in for the morning, you, you, might, you might have this like timesheet or a thing that you have to fill out, like I showed up at 8 a.m. and you know, I took a break or whatever. Um, these guys make that really um, automatic. So you, every um, employee has a credit card, a little reloadable debit card. And when they get in in the morning, they dip into their jar that's sitting right in front of their register. And it says, OK, you know, John showed up at 8 p.m. or whatever you started working, John. Um, and the tips show up on that card while that person is sort of dipped in. Uh, and so all the money that they get, you never have to like empty the big cash jar and sort the quarters and all that stuff. You can just use that debit card and go buy stuff in the store. So it's pr pretty pretty cool little little business model. All right, this is this is probably one of the most interesting categories, which is called hardware as a service. Um, and these are companies that really focus on r eliminating the cost of hardware to optimize for software. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite examples: a company called Meraki, uh, which Cisco bought for an incredibly large sum of money a year or two ago. Uh, and these guys build this really um, a sort of managed, automatic, and beautiful experience for provisioning Wi-Fi devices uh, in your office, and sort of like all internet-connected devices in your office. And it's sort of funny, because you kind of get sucked into this really beautiful hardware. It's kind of like designed like Apple, all like beautiful aluminum and plastic and shiny. Uh, and, and you install it, and then you don't realize like every year you're going to have to pay like $10,000 to keep this thing running. Um, and so it's sort of frustrating in certain regards, but it's also the experience of using Meraki is so wonderful. And I don't know if you guys have ever managed your IT stuff in your small office or your home. It sucks. And like stuff breaks, and everyone's yelling at you, and like why is the email down? And what's really cool about these guys, you can pick up the phone at any time, and someone will remotely log into your thing and just sort of fix any problem that you might have, which is a really powerful thing if you run an office of you know, 10 or 20 people. Uh, uh, I think upselling is, is also quite interesting. Um, this is when you have a free service or app, uh, and then you sell hardware on top of that, which adds some new feature or benefit to the user. Um, if if you all uh, do any kind of sketching or, or, or artwork, you may know of this really cool iPad app uh, called Paper. Uh, and they sell sort of like half cut off there. But they sell this really neat sort of sketchbook. You can share things. You can kind of paint things and, and sketch. It's really useful for anybody who's creating stuff. And about a year or two after they launched, they came out with this product called Pencil, um, which uh, you can see sort of see at the bottom here, um, which, which is this really elegant stylus that sort of enables you to use the app in a sort of more interesting, fluid way. And so you can kind of erase things. You can like change the thickness of the line really easily. Um, and so it, it, it sort of increases the value of the app. And also, the company gets to capture money from selling the, the actual product itself. OK, and this is by far my favorite. Um, this is uh, a, a Keurig model. You probably all know Keurig or Nespresso. I'm not sure which one's which is bigger here. Nespresso is pretty big. Yeah, eh, bummer. OK, well, Nespresso for X. Um, Nespresso is a much better brand, uh, which is a long, interesting story. Um, and so this is the idea that you sell. You, you're, you're aiming not to sell a device, but to sell those little capsules that you may, may know with the coffee, the little K-cups. Um, and there is um, a whole host of businesses that use this model, which I believe are going to be huge in the coming years. Um, so this is one of my favorites. Um, this is a company called Cuvée. And they build this really cool connected wine bottle. And so the, the bottle of wine, which sort of looks and feels just like a normal bottle in terms of like its size and weight, um, it looks a little different. It has a full touch screen uh, on the front there. And it's made out of like really nice metal and glass. Um, and the idea here is, is, is you, um, you purchase wine that's on their system. And, and there are a whole series of problems with the wine industry. Um, uh, th it sort of starts with preservation. It's really hard to like, I, I sometimes want to drink like only one glass of wine. I know it's surprising. And, um, but if you only drink one glass of wine, the, the bottle of wine goes bad in a couple of days. And so one of the really powerful features about the way this system works is it keeps wine good for eight weeks. So you can drink half a glass of wine, and then you can put it away. And you can come back two months later and drink another glass of wine, and it tastes exactly the same. And you don't pay anything for that. It's part of the system. Um, the other thing is buying wine is this like, really frustrating experience. Like I walk into a wine store, and I have like, no idea like, what I want. There's just hundreds of bottles and all these people like, judging me about like, how expensive the bottle is or whatever. And I find it really overwhelming. And I think a lot of people do. It's a really frustrating part of, of the drinking, which is you don't want to be frustrated when you're drinking. And, um, 
And so the way this works is a little bit more like Netflix. It actually monitors how you drink wine and can say, listen, you've been drinking this wine really fast. Um, if it's too fast, it'll tell you to slow down. But if it's just right, it'll tell you to order more. Um, it'll also give you suggestions about other kinds of wine that are similar to that kind of wine, and it kind of figures out what you like, and then you can just reorder more wine from the bottle. Um, and on that experience, when you're actually looking at the bottle, you can see uh, you know, food pairings and ratings and all kinds of other interesting things that sort of go along with the wine that's, that's inside. Um, the real business, though, is actually on the distribution side. And what makes these businesses both really hard to build and really interesting to build is they disrupt the supply chain. So Keurig, as an example of a company, a lot of people would be blown away to realize that they sell $5 billion of coffee every year. Single largest seller and grower of coffee in the world, um, which is, at least to me, like totally mind-blowing. Uh, it's also about 100% more expensive than buying the same coffee not in those stupid little cups, which is really frustrating. And those cups are really not very environmentally friendly. So there's all kinds of issues. Um, but the supply chain is really interesting. Um, they sell about a pound and a half of coffee for every coffee drinking adult in the United States, um, which is really just amazing. Um, but in, in order to do that, they have to build this incredibly robust supply chain that starts really early on with people that are growing coffee and goes all the way up through the harvesting and roasting, packaging, and distribution of that coffee. And that's a really hard business to build. But once you do it, it's really hard to, to disrupt. So these guys have to build a wine distribution business, which is really hard. Um, but because they have software on their side, they can kind of make all that stuff much more cost effective and fast, um, which we find really interesting. And I think those are the 10 that I had. You guys have.